Spoiler warning to you fine people. I recently saw the movie, you've probably heard of it, Barbie. And I liked it a lot. I did. I, I thought it was a, a good movie. Certainly better than I expected. And it was also an inarguably feminist movie. I would say that while it did not fully escape the trap of liberal feminism, it was definitely on the better end within that uh, ideological range. It was definitely like, um, you know, it was it was on the upper end in, in, in that side of things. And uh, what's more, uh, you know, I think it had some interesting stuff to say about men as well. So spoilers ahead, because our man Benny Boy did a video, big old video, Ben Shapiro, stop. Ben Shapiro destroys the Barbie movie for 45 seconds, which is, as I understand it, going to open with an embarrassing shot of him throwing some Barbies on fire or whatever, uh, lighting them on fire. I don't know. He, he really looking to get the clickbait engagement here. A lot of dislikes, which tells me this video's attention escaped the Ben Shapiro uh, sphere. Let's see what's going on here. Got back from the theaters seeing Barbie. Barbie. and Oppenheimer. I'm about to review both of them. I'm gonna tell you which one of these is the best blockbuster of 2023 and which one is maybe the worst. I bet he loved our movie, right, Ken? For those of you who can't- I'm going to get a lot of secondhand embarrassment watching this and this is not an emotion I enjoy working through, to be honest with you guys. So if I feel it at any point necessary to speed up or skip through, I will do so without apology. Wait that long, I'm gonna give my review of the Barbie movie in the most Oppenheimer fashion. What the f Ryan. All right, okay, yep, okay. For my audience, my producers dragged me to go see Barbie movie, Barbie the movie, and, um, and right. um, I, have, I have thoughts. This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Is it? Let me begin with my generalized assessment of the movie. This movie is not just a piece of shit. This movie is a flaming piece of dog shit piled atop an uh -huh. entire dumpster on fire, piled atop a landfill filled with dog shit. It is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. On uh -huh. every possible level, it is a horrific movie. The only thing that can be said for this film is production design. The production design is really nice. The costumes are really nice. That's also, true. Also, it's really hard to screw that up. It's really hard to screw that up because you literally have this to model after. All you have to do is this, but big. Okay, it's really not tough, but... It is not hard to screw that up, taking the aesthetic of a plastic toy brand and making that a cohesive film world and making... Okay, no, it's not... That's not easy at all. Actually, I was, I was very impressed with the work they did there. Okay. Put aside all of the beautiful costumes, which is there for the ladies, and all of the production design and, and the Barbie universe and all of that. Every joke that happens in this film happens basically within the first 45 seconds of the film. Okay. So, for example, Barbie turns on the water and there's no water. Ooh, because, you know, like in Barbie house, there's no actual water. Do, do you get it? And then she drinks, but there's no actual liquid in the, in, the actual, in the actual cup. Oh, my God, because she's a Barbie doll. Oh, I get it. Okay, that's all the jokes. There are no more jokes for the rest of the film. There are jokes... The entire film, uh, that was in the opening montage that had the song playing over it. It was just a way of establishing the cartoonish, uh, I, I guess, nature of the Barbie Land setting. Um, it was both funny and world building because it indicated that they weren't human and didn't live by human rules. Uh, but there were jokes after that. If you haven't seen the movie, it's going to be tough to keep you up in a lot of this, but I'm just here to... Because the reason why Ben is mad about this and the reason why the right wing doesn't like the Barbie movie is because it has made an enormous amount of money and it is very popular and it is doing very well and it's a very loud feminist film that has a mainstream trans character in it. It's a woke movie, so he has to pretend that it's comprehensively bad when in reality, this is just a political opposition. If if the Barbie movie was identical, except for the fact that its overriding message is that women should uh, remain subservient and live in a kind of like 1950s Stepford wife state for the rest of their lives, he would love the movie and would defend it. It has nothing to do with the movie itself. Put the spoiler text back up on the screen. No. The movie's a shit show. Okay, so conceptually, the movie is a shit show. I want to ask this. Who is the intended audience for this film? Who's the intended audience for this film? So I'll tell you who the intended audience for this film is. And I can tell two ways. One, the previews on the film, and two, the people in the audience. So the intended audience for this film is moms and their eight-year-old daughters. That's the intended audience for the film. I know because the previews for the film were all- The movie has jokes about sexual assault, rape, genitalia, um, and a lot of it focuses on socioeconomic analysis of the real world that's explicitly discussed. It's a PG-13 movie, so I don't really think it's trying to go for the eight-year-old audience. The movie correctly points out that eight-year-old girls don't tend to play with Barbies anymore. When it's found that a person in the real world is playing with Barbie, it's actually an older woman, not a young girl. All kids' movies. I'm talking like G or PG rated. 
kids' films. We're talking like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles it's or Trolls PG 4 or whatever 13. it is. Those were all the previews, right? All the previews are actually directed at what the audience is supposed to be for this film. And if you look in the audience, it's a bunch of moms, like youngish moms, middle-aged moms with their like six, seven, eight-year-old girls. That's the entire crew. When I went to the audience, it was basically all adults in the theater, as far as I could tell. Like the impression I got, I wasn't exactly like scanning the entire theater while looking around. As I understand it from the money the movie's making and the demographic test they've done, it's pretty popular across the board, though obviously it's going to have more women probably proportionally than the average movie. This movie is not made for any of those people. In fact, this movie is made for no one. This movie is going to make a bunch of money week one because the marketing effort has been extraordinary. I mean, whoever's the marketing team over at Warner Brothers is doing an amazing job. That's week true. one, this thing is going to clean up at the domestic box office. My prediction is going to just absolutely fall off a cliff after that. The repeat business on this movie is going to be non-existent because it was written by two people who are so smug and self-satisfied and Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach that they have no audience. I mean, like, the, who thought it's a great idea? Let's bring on the people who wrote Lady Bird and Marriage Story to make a movie about a plastic doll that is generally- I don't know what to say about this. The movie's like breaking box office records. It's just, he's mad that it's doing that. The movie's quite well written for what it is, I think. He played with by five to nine year old young girls. So the basic idea of the film, they, they really have no basic idea of the film. They don't... It's, it's also kind of indicative that he sort of missed the point that he thinks that Barbie is something that's played with by five to nine year old girls when for most people, Barbie is the thing they remember women playing with or girls playing with when they were younger, but it exists now as a memory. Like nowadays, pe yeah, people are on their iPad. Like little girls are on their iPad. Playing with dolls while growing up, that's more associated with an older era. And for that reason, and the movie points this out, it's representative of like an older generation of people who grew up with Barbies. So it's not, yeah, okay. I don't know whether they hate Barbie or they we're supposed to kind of like Barbie. It, it, it seems they kind of despise Barbie as a fascist emblem, as we'll get to. The oh my God, actually allergic to media analysis. Holy shit. Um, you are supposed to like Barbie. The movie unambiguously frames her as a likable character. At one point in the movie, a little girl who is clearly meant to be a stand-in for like SJWs, brusquely accuses her of being fascist in a way that is framed in the movie as in it's like uncredible and insincere it is a joke like the joke is that the little girl flies off the handle you're like you're fascist barbie and then barbie cries but it's a joke you're not supposed to agree with the girl and the girl later changes her perspective okay basic sort of premise of the film politically speaking is that men and women are on two sides of the divide and they and they hate each other and literally the only way you can have a happy world is if the women ignore the men and the men ignore the women. N no, not even a little bit, not even remotely. I'll let him continue. That seems to be the, the final outcome of this film. I was oh. trying to separate this into problems with plot and problems with character and problems with, with the politics of the film, but they're all intertwined because the thing is just a mess. It doesn't make any sense. Plot-wise, it makes no sense. Character-wise, it makes no sense. So let's just go through it from the beginning. Okay, there's gonna be lots of spoilers, but believe you hey. me, I'm about to save you so much time. Because this movie is two hours. It feels like it is longer than the Wagnerian ring cycle. It, I, I promise you it doesn't. The movie was paced excellently. I never felt bored. And it, 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 there was never like a point where it dragged. It was quite well paced. It does not end. Every scene is at least two minutes too long. Every single scene, every beat is two minutes too long. It is a bad film. Put aside the politics. Like, really, I, I was sitting there with a bunch of my producers. I'm a little bit more political than my producers. My producers were watching this, putting the politics aside. It is a bad movie. So why is it getting 91% on Rotten Tomatoes? He's more political than his producers at the Daily Wire, the far-right media org. So, hey, my apolitical producers at the Daily Wire. It was because the way that it works for the reviewers is if you have the right politics, and those politics are sufficiently slyly inserted, then it will get a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes, even if the thing is just direct. Oh yeah, the politics in Barbie are very sly. They're very subtle. They definitely don't have one of the central characters literally give a multi-minute feminist rant directly at the screen and to every character in the story uh, while talking about the uh, internal inconsistencies of being a woman and use the word patriarchy like 50 times. Slyly. And I mean, boy, is this direct. This is a, this is a Death Star side. We're not going to be able to make it through all of this. I, I, I swear to God, it's not going to be possible. This piece of direct. 
It is like, that's no moon. That's a direct station. Okay. That is that, that this movie. Okay, so let, let's jump into it. I have like pages and pages of notes on this horrific piece of shit. I mean, my goodness. Okay, so let's start right at the beginning. So it's at, at, from the beginning, you know what this movie is going to be, and it's going to be a very cynical take on what Barbie is, which is so weird. I don't know why Mattel would turn... Not even a little bit. The final message of the movie is not even a little bit cynical. It's actually quite enthusiastic about the role that idealized femininity can have in people's self-perception. Turn over its IP. To you, yeah, you might notice he's not actually holding notes. This cartoonishly large scrawl that he's staring at is almost certainly just scribble. I can't recognize any upside down characters in it. The filmmakers clearly hate the IP. It, it, it's as though you were going to make Toy Story, except that toys are all evil. They're all bad and you're supposed to hate them and you should burn them. What? Because that's kind of the message of the film is that the Barbies are bad for the world. Okay, so. What? It, what? 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 How? Where? What? Begins by trying to uphold the original vision of Barbie. What was the original magical vision of Barbie? We have Helen Mirren here to tell us in the form of a narrator apparently played by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's speaking from heaven. And uh, we get a 2000... Different Ruth. ...one, a Space Odyssey flashback. Which again, who's the audience for this? Right, the reference points in this film, it references variously Marcel Proust, it references Robert Evans and the cinematography of The Godfather, it references 2001, A Space Odyssey, this is a movie made for moms and their seven-year-old girls. No, it was a movie made for adults and a wide range of people who are seeing the movie. You are the one saying that it was for eight-year-old girls. It's, that, that's you saying that. Well, folks, wasting two hours of my precious time, two hours I will never get back, two hours around my deathbed, I will wish that I had not spent that time uh -huh, with uh -huh. me viscerally angry. But I'm going to talk to you about something that makes me much happier. And oh, my God. Trusted privacy program, Holy shit. What if there was someone out there who kept a log of every single thing you did every minute of the day? Creepy, right? What if I told you that's exactly what happens every time you go online? Your ISP is tracking and logging every single website you've ever visited. You can legally sell that information to anyone, which is why I use ExpressVPN. If there's anything we're going to take from this, let it be the fact that conservatism as an ideology is predicated almost entirely on an inability to understand the world around you. The takes that he's already had about media here are so bad that they, they it's like listening to a blind man describe a painting. It's, 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 it's not just like, oh, subjectively he had a different take and it's just, it, it goes in the territory of being wrong. And conservatives have to do this with art because all art disagrees with them, or at the very least, quite a lot of it. That back in the day, girls would only play with dolls, dolls that looked like babies. And then she says that no this could be fun, at least for a while anyway. Ask your mother, because your mother actually hates you and doesn't like being a mom, you see. So that's so if you ask your mom, she wants to play at not being a mom sometime. Okay, so the basic Ha, a joke that parenting can be tiring means your mom hates you. Uh-huh. The premise is Barbie is supposed to be the independent woman who liberates Don't all womanhood, me. but she fails. And she Don't fails for two reasons. One, she's actually a tool of the patriarchal capitalist system. And two, the real world has rejected the message of Barbie, which is that women should run everything. Okay, so th this is all no. not implicit. This is explicitly said. At the beginning, the monologue, you have Helen Mirren saying, because Barbie can be anything, women can be anything. At least that's what the Barbies think. See, in the real world, women can't be anything. And that's one of the messages of the film. In the real world, men run pretty much everything. Which is weird. Who greenlit this piece of shit? I mean, Greta Gerwig is a lady. She's making a good living off of this. Margot Robbie. Is he seriously going to argue that the patriarchy doesn't exist because this movie has a female director? The Barbie movie has a female director and female lead. And this is also the highest grossing female director led movie in Hollywood history because every other movie that's grossed this much is male directors. Like that, he's he's going to use it. The the upper echelons of directing in Hollywood are actually more gender biased than most things in society. I feel like you could find more women in construction yards than you can find them in blockbuster AAA Hollywood releases. Bobby is playing the lead. In fact, the entire cast, aside from basically Ryan Gosling, is women. So, um, in the Barbie movie, yes, in yes, it is the Barbie movie, yes. It seems like women are doing okay. In the like, again, this is the level of conservative analysis we're dealing with here, where he's like, oh, patriarchy exists? Well, in this Barbie movie, there are lots of women. Like, that's actually the level that we're engaging with. That's actually where we are. But, again, put aside the metalogic of it. I'm going to go through, like, a lot of beats here. So it starts off with the idea that mommy dolls are bad and insufficient. But then they criticize Mattel for discontinuing a mommy doll named Midge. Right? Midge is the pregnant doll, and it was discontinued. They're like, that's bad. 
Wait, but hold on. You just said that, that dolls about motherhood. Are what? What? Oh, he's like fully just jumping between anything. The movie never criticized Mattel for discontinuing a pregnant Barbie doll. They made a joke because a um they 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 said like oh that was weird. But the joke in the movie was that the tone of of the of of the statement was like an acknowledgement of the arbitrariety of that decision, and it has nothing to do with the beginning at the uh, of, with the opening with the mom dolls. Th those aren't connected at all. Those those two scenes happen like ten minutes apart too are bad but then this one stop stop talking about the crack pipe or i'm going to ban all of you holy shit i don't have the file on my computer anymore i said i wasn't doing it anymore don't look for any sort of logical coherence there is a citizens united reference they say all of the members of the barbie supreme court are women and then they are speaking out about citizens united that corporations are not people it's literally a citizens united reference who is the audience for this who who is the seven adults adults ben you the reason you're going to see fifty thousand jokes and references that only make sense if you're an adult is because it's a movie primarily for adults. That's why the movie opens with film references and political jokes. It's not a kid's movie the way that, like, I don't know, Paw Patrol is. A kid can watch the movie. It was all adults in my theater. Little girl who's like, yes, I too have a, a, a very informed perspective on the Citizens United decision. And then they say that logic and feeling at the same time it doesn't diminish us. It proves that we are more than, right? It's, it's all propagandistic. And uh, w w what? It was a tongue in cheek joke after they rule against Citizens United. One of the, the Supreme Court uh, justices or perhaps one of the lawyers is like, I use both my emotion and my logic and that makes me strong. And it's like, they're still doing this in the opening montage. So the joke here is like, they're self-consciously acknowledging the tropes about femininity and using them as a plus rather than a minus. That's the joke. It's Barbie land. The whole point is that they exist as commercialized and stereotypical idealizations of femininity in different roles. That's the entire point of that place. Then it sets up the dichotomy. The dichotomy is that men and women are in complete and utter contradistinction in terms of their roles. So women only exist if they are completely free of men, and men only exist if they are completely free of women. And the problem for Ken- the That is not even remotely what the movie suggests about men and women at all, actually. Not even slightly. The problem is set up for Ken is that Ken is dependent on Barbie, right? because ben, Ken is kind of secondary. And we also set up at the very beginning that Barbie doesn't like Ken. She finds Ken annoying. She finds Ken ridiculous, which again is sort of against the concept of Ken and Barbie. But the, the basic idea- No. In movie, they explicitly state that the reason for the uh, the disconnect there is that Barbie has taken on her own identity, whereas Ken is only thought of in relation to Barbie. So to Ken, Barbie is necessary, but to Barbie, Ken is secondary. That's a trope that makes sense because it's reaffirmed by the actual sales numbers of these dolls under Mattel. We all know who and what Barbie is, but if we heard the name Ken on its own, that's just a name, right? Like. If you're in America, at least, and somebody says Barbie, they think of the toy. If they hear Ken on its own, well, it's, yeah, Street Fighter Ken, you know? It's just Ken. But Ken and Barbie, well, then there's a pairing. So it's set up by, like, real life. It makes total sense. The idea is that, that Barbie is an independent woman and Ken is completely superfluous. Uh -huh. We then go to the beach, and there's a scene on the beach where Ken, the Kens are, are, are supposed to be the lifeguards, and the ladies are playing on the beach. No and we had a series right of gay masturbation jokes. Again, there's an audience for children. No, it's not. It's PG-13. Ben, did you not see? It's PG-13. They're talking about beaching each other off. Right? There's a, a, a line where Ken says to another one of the Kens, I'm going to beat you off. Get it, get it, you get it? Because it's like, like beat you off, but beat you off. And yes, it's a crass masturbation joke, which are allowed in PG-13 movies. Yes, that is, th that is allowed. That is allowed in these movies, yes. Then they repeat that no less than four or five times in the span of 45 seconds. If I wasn't severely injured, I would beat you off for right now. I actually found this to be the least funny joke in the movie, uh, fun fact. Ken, I'll beat you off with you anyway. No Ken. copyright. Anyone who wants to beat him off has to beat me off first. I will beat both of you off at the same time. Beat both, both of us off. Beach. Nobody's gonna beat anyone off. Bazinga. <laughs> because it's just such a great gay masturbation joke. You, you gotta go for it. I mean, what else will the seven-year-old girls in the audience think if you don't go for this? I, this is, okay, this is getting to the point where I feel like this is like grooming by insertion. Where, like, in, imagine if, imagine if like Ben Shapiro is watching a porn movie. Like, 
on Pornhub. And he's like, well, what? Oh, well, what if there was a little girl in that room? It's like, why the fuck are you bringing a mental little girl into this? What are you talking about, Ben? What the fuck are you talking about, Ben? For the gay masturbation joke on the beach. Clearly, clearly. We get black female President Barbie because this is, of course, the greatest of all possible worlds of Kamala Harris. The Barbie version is, is the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. She was just like Kamala Harris. And that's definitely not a statement you're making purely because she's a black woman. And you're just thinking black woman equals Kamala Harris. Just just racism. <laughs> there was no personality similarity between them at all. Don't look alike. Just say, yeah, just saying. All right. And then we get the break, right? Then we get the actual plot point. Plot point number one. Mm -hmm. Barbie has irrepressible thoughts of death. So again, at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a second, isn't this a kid's movie? No! How many times? Isn't this supposed to be made for seven-year-old girls? No. Nope. PG-13. Parental guidance if you're under 13. Ergo, not made. They can, if they can go, if there's a parent there, I saw PG-13 movies when I wasn't 13 yet, but they weren't made for six-year-olds. It's about existential angst over, angst over mortality. That's what this film is about. Now, again, interlinked. That's not what the film is about. That's a feeling that Barbie had that pulled her away from Barbie land. That was something that broke the illusion for her. But the movie isn't about existential angst. It's, it's about a lot of stuff. Angst. Through all of this, is just more and more and more politics, right? One of the Barbies is a trans Barbie. Mm -hmm. And this is treated totally normally, as though this is a female Barbie with a voice, again, deeper than my own. So everyone's voice is deeper than your own, Ben. Uh, also, um, they never mention the trans Barbie being trans, which means that it is actually him imposing politics and not anyone else in this movie. They never have her mention, hey, I'm trans, Bar like it's, she's just a person, a character who he's mad about. Barbie starts to have these irrepressible thoughts of death. And this comes along with physical symptoms. Like for example, her feet flatten out. Again, this is one of the few cute jokes in the movie is that Barbie walks around and just like a normal Barbie doll. When you take off the shoes, the feet are shaped like the, like the shoe, like a high heel. But now she is turning into like a real world person. And so her feet collapse, right? And so she goes to see weird. Uh, see, I like how they pitched down her scream, even though it was really high pitched in the movie because she's a trans woman. Uh, that was the trans Barbie. I know you can't tell because uh, uh, she passes really well, which probably upsets Ben. But uh, yeah, they pitched that down like eight octaves. <laughs> that was like, that was pretty high pitched in the, uh, in the uh, movie. Barbie. So Weird Barbie is a Barbie that has been played with too hard and has all the knowledge, not only about me. Barbie land, but also about the real world. And apparently there's a connection me. between people playing with the Barbies and the Barbies. So if people playing with Barbies are sad, then the Barbies also get sad. Weird that this has only happened to Barbie because it turns out that lots of people are sad and played with Barbies for a very long time. But that's the plot point. Fine. And again, the concept of like a Barbie that was played with too hard is very funny because everybody has seen that before. And they somehow blow this. Somehow they make this into a not funny thing. So Weird Barbie is, is ugly and she has bad makeup and all the rest of it. And she informs Barbie she has to go to the real world and she has to find the person who is playing with her and she has to make that person feel better because that will heal the problem that she's having in Barbie land. Okay, so we have our plot point, right? We have the thing that's going to launch us off into the rest of the movie. And then it's just a complete mess from here on in. Okay. At least at this point, it's, it's kind of dumb but coherent. From here on in, it makes no sense at all. Again, Kate McKinnon sets up the dichotomy that, that pretty much the makers of the film hate Barbie by suggesting that you can live in fancy land with Barbie and you can take the Barbie shoe or you can take Birkenstocks, right? You can, you can become like a Portland lesbian and you can learn about reality. That it was Venice Beach was where she was going to. And people often wear Birkenstocks at Venice Beach, including me, when I have been to Venice Beach. It's not a Portland lesbian thing. That's the joke. That was one of those jokes that he missed there, where Venice Beach was represented by Birkenstocks. That, that, that's, the, that, that's going to be the choice that you have to make. But not before she makes a joke about Ken and wanting to see the nude blob he is packing under those pants. That's so, that's crazy. Somebody said that? Perfect for eight-year-old girls, ladies. Mothers, just be, be warned. Ken and Barbie head off to the- What? I, I don't know what he's referring to here exactly. Uh, so I can't really speak to it. Sorry. Real world to try to find the, the person who is playing with Barbie. And immediately upon arriving in the real world, Barbie is hit with an overwhelming tsunami of sexism. Like right away, boom, she walks in and a bunch of men just leer at her and say, give us a smile, blondie which is something that no one under the age of 70 has, has said to a woman in the recent past. Give us a smile, Blondie. Seriously? Okay, so the real world in this movie is still portrayed in a cartoonish way. Later on, Barbie will go to Mattel headquarters and have like a Looney Tunes chase sequence or like a Scooby-Doo chase sequence where like people will pass by each other and like bounce off and like teleport around and... Um, the real world in the Barbie movie is also cartoonish. So it's not like she's really entering reality here. What she's entering is hyper-reality. 
a kind of exaggerated portrayal of real life in the ways that it contrasts from hers. So in Barbie land, women have all social and political power. When she walks uh, down the street, she's acknowledged by all the other Barbies, usually in an extremely uh, like, uh, you know, girl power, hello, it's so nice to see you kind of way. Uh, in the real world, when she steps in there, the contrast is that she's also being addressed and recognized just as much. But there is a leering uh, 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 attitude of sexual predation that she feels uncomfortable with, but he doesn't. But Ken doesn't, I mean. So the point is contrasting her experience in Barbie land with her experience in the real world by paying attention to the differences that she would take note of. Also, women get told to smile pretty often. Uh, and I think the term blondie probably isn't that uncommon on Venice Beach. I, I, we, we get Barbie explaining that all of the men who are, who are leering at her and gazing at her, they, are, they have an undertone of violence. Everything's in, she, she's threatened. She's physically threatened because this is the real world. The real world is not like Barbie land. In the real world, all women are, are victims. They are deep and abiding victims. Of no, just something between a quarter and one third of women, actually. Possibly more, depending on where you draw the line for sexual assault. So... Barbie said she felt like there was a violent air to the attention that was being paid to her, and then almost immediately afterwards, she's sexually assaulted. As you just saw, a man rolls up to her and slaps her ass, and she punches him, uh, and then she freaks out, and she and Ken are arrested, uh, because from everyone's perspective, she just turned around and punched a guy. Also, again, not a movie for seven-year-olds. As we'll learn by the use of the word patriarchy no less than ten times in this film. She gets arrested, like, twice for various crimes. Even the police officers are rabid, raging sexists. The police officers are hit. Who could, who could imagine that? A world in which police officers are sexist. Hitting on Barbie. They're making observations about her appearance. Ken, meanwhile, is getting super happy because Ken, who has been sort of an underling in Barbie land, now he's realizing he's part of the patriarchy. And the patriarchy is awesome. Ken is loving the patriarchy. Now. That's not what happens yet. Uh, Ken doesn't discover the patriarchy for a while. At this point in the film, Ken is just surprised to see men in roles of authority. Uh, he's also happy to see that people are taking him seriously rather than treating him as like an incidental object second to Barbie. Uh, he doesn't know about the patriarchy yet. He's just enjoying the attention that he's getting. You might imagine at this point that the way the film is going to go is that Ken and Barbie are going to have to some sort of agree about seeing each other as equal human beings. You might imagine that's where it's going wrong. That's not where the Why would that be where the movie goes? Barbie and Ken both come from a world where their value as men and women are completely separate and segregated. Why would they enter this world and then immediately have that conversation? They don't, because they're consumed by their biases. That's the point. Barbie and Ken view the real world uh, in very different ways because of their pre-existing experiences. Ken's marginalization in Barbie land gives him legitimate reason to see men in positions of power and be happy about it. And likewise, Barbie being immediately uh, sexually assaulted and uh, uh, harassed by the men around her gives her reason to assess. Yeah, it's fish out of water stuff, exactly. Um, when fish exit the water in a movie, they don't immediately go, oh, well, we're out of the water now, so um, I guess we should adjust to our surroundings and then instantly change. But keep in mind that Ben Shapiro has an ongoing hatred for Hollywood screenwriters because he tried to be one and failed. And if you ever read a book written by him, you'll know why. The film is going to go. You might have thought that what you were going to get was Ken gets treated with respect as a person and Barbie gets treated with respect as a person. And that's a better, nope. Why would that, wait, why would that ha They enter the real world, which is patriarchal. Why would Barbie then get treated as a, wh what? That doesn't make any sense at all in the context of the movie as it's set up thus far. It, it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Wrong, in the end, not to skip ahead, Barbie Land just gets restored and the men are still subservient. That's the best, that's the best. Well, hold on. We'll get to the ending of the movie when we get to the end of the movie. Version of the world. Okay, so Ken is walking around and he's really enjoying the patriarchy and all of this. And um, he explains that men rule this world. And he goes to Mattel and all the members of the board are, are men. By the way, I'd like to see a corporate breakdown of the Mattel board. I'll bet, I'll bet I can find it. Like the CEO of Mattel for 30 years was a woman. So there's that. They mention that in the movie. They pretend that like Mattel is all run by men. So I just, now, now I want to know who is the, who's on the board. Okay, CEO is, Chairman CEO is a dude. The board includes one, two, three, four, five. It includes five women. So it's six men and five women. This is going to shock you guys, but in real life, the CEO of Mattel is also not Will Ferrell. Because the movie is presenting a hyper-real uh, uh, slice of the world, we're not seeing a literal representation of demographic trends in all aspects of society. We are seeing a slice of it meant to exacerbate and reaffirm certain ideological and sociological trends. 
much in the same way that Barbie is, is an exaggerated portrayal of an idyllic, sexless, female-oriented paradise, the real world is framed in contrast to those ideas, and the disproportionate influence of men is held up with increased prominence. Yes, in other words, it is a piece of art where things are depicted in ways that do not perfectly conform with real life to make a point if you can imagine such a thing. Clearly patriarchal domination, clearly patriarchal domination. Just wanted to look that up just for the sake of, you know, accuracy. Whenever I do these reviews, like, oh, you're taking the movie too seriously. The movie takes itself too seriously, guys. It absolutely does not, not even remotely, uh, not to spoil, but I will spoil. The final few minutes of the movie are actually a pretty harrowing and emotionally powerful introspection on Barbie's role as a human and as a person and as an idea. And then the movie finally ends in a joke about her becoming a human and visiting the gynecologist. You think that she's like leaving the car to go get a job or something in the real world, but nope, she's making a visit to the gynecologist because as previously addressed by the movie, she has never had a vagina before. It pretends to be a comedy, but it's taking itself super seriously. Fine. So it's not even a little true. It is a comedy. It's all men at the top of Mattel and they realize that Barbie and Ken have escaped Barbie land. And this presents some sort of threat. What kind of threat? Because the writers are shitty. They don't bother explaining. They're just like a threat. And Will Ferrell acts all weird and goofy, like Will Ferrell. And he's funny because it's Will Ferrell acting weird and goofy. But he's not funny because it's just Will Ferrell with no actual plot or dialogue to speak of, just being weird. We'll fill that in later. I've done that. There's so many places in the script where it's basically like the writers just, they left a gap and they're like, we'll leave a couple asterisks, we'll fill it in later. And then the threat that Mattel thought they represented was not even remotely relevant to the plot. There was no reason, no narrative purpose to understanding why Mattel had an issue with Barbie and Ken running around in the real world. Mattel's concerns are not the concerns of our characters. Uh, the point of the Mattel board, in large part, was that they were incompetent and flustered and generally unaware of what was going on. Like, it, we, there's no reason at all why we would need an explanation on why Mattel wants Barbie and Ken contained. Exercise a little bit of creative thinking. Maybe they want them contained because Barbie and Ken are toys, and seeing toys wandering around in the real world would raise really troubling metaphysical questions that they don't want to answer to, say, to Congress? Believe that's the reason. Later, they got there and they're like, nah, we'll just, we'll just skip right over it. Fine. So they figured they got to track down Barbie and Ken. And meanwhile, Barbie is trying to track down the girl who's playing with her. And she mistakenly thinks that it is a teenage girl who is playing with her and who is unhappy. And uh, at this point, she receives a lecture from the teenage girl about how Barbie has ruined the world and actually is fascist. How Barbie is a sexualized capitalistic emblem. How Barbie has created unattainable feminine ideals. Mm -hmm. How Barbie is ruining the planet with rampant consumerism. You get like this full lecture right in the middle of the film. Uh -huh. It's truly awful. Oh my God. The little girl gives this rant to Barbie and Barbie runs away crying. The little girl is meant to serve as a representation of modern feminist and leftist critiques of Barbie as both a toy and an idea. But as the movie progresses, these ideas are refined in ways that better represent the ideology of that girl. She becomes friends with Barbie, and the criticisms become folded into the narrative of the story in ways that are more fair and charitable and less cynical. In other words, this is Barbie confronting the cynicism of a modern left-leaning girl, somebody who she expected to be a fan of hers. It's not, a, it's not a rant where you're meant to go, oh, you tell her, little girl, you're completely correct. Which is why, after Barbie runs away crying, the story continues following Barbie, and we see her sad, and we sympathize with her, because when the narrative follows the plot arc and interests and feelings of the main character, it's in a way of implicitly building sympathy for their perspective. You see, this is what's known as a character growth. Uh, that's why they have different perspectives later on than they do immediately. Everyone's perspective changes as the movie goes on. But I'm sure Ben Shapiro, because he's a f idiot, listened to that little girl giving her speech and thought this was meant to be taken as a fully straightforward, upfront, completely uncritical rant from the screenwriters directly to you with absolutely no... And then, Ben, how do you explain the fact that she changed her mind later? How do you, how do you explain that fact? It's truly really awful. She's called a fascist. By the way, it only sets up the, the only good line of the film, truly, in my opinion. There's one good line in the film, and that is where Barbie is trying to contemplate whether she's a fascist or not, and she says, I don't control the railways or the flow of commerce. Now... <laughs> That was a good joke. Also not a joke a seven-year-old girl would understand, Ben, so I'm glad that you, an adult, got some enjoyment out of that joke that was intended for adults. 
There's only one problem with that line. As with the entire movie, there is no character consistency. Barbie is supposed to be an idiot bubblehead piece of plastic from Barbie. No. She's portrayed as intelligent the entire way through the film. She's never portrayed as dumb. She's portrayed as naive because she doesn't know anything about the real world. They, they extensively talk about how Barbie, as both her specifically and every Barbie, is, is, is intelligent and capable in their own respective way. She's not ever framed as dumb. Like, that's just a pretty sexist thing to assume. It's not an assumption you could arrive at naturally. You'd have to have a pre-existing bias there. She's naive, because she's never been to the real world, but that's not being done. Barbie land. How does she know what a fascist is? How does she know what, about the flow of commerce? Like, again, just in terms of character consistency, like characters who actually are the characters, makes no sense. She knows about these things because she's not entirely unaware of the real world. When she gets told about what's happening to her body in Barbie Land, her fleet, uh, feet flattening and everything, she talks about the real world with knowledge. That means she knows she exists in a kind of pocket dimension. It's entirely possible that the knowledge she has of the real world has given her a kind of uh, approximate, uh, loose understanding of what's gone on over there. I find, actually, personally, I think this is phenomenal comedy because the idea of, like, Barbie half remembering World War II and trying to explain it while like smiling through it is very, very funny to me. Uh, the, it was framed as a joke, Ben. Like the joke was you wouldn't expect that line from her, but she's not framed as stupid. It's just a bit of knowledge she picks up on. Doesn't she also visit the library at one point? Or was that only Ken? Whatsoever. So I think that was only Ken. Meanwhile, Ken is wandering around, enjoying the patriarchy more and more and more. And uh, he keeps asking men about the patriarchy. And at one point, he asks a dude about the patriarchy. And the guy says, well, that's not really the way that it works here anymore. He says, really? He says, no, it still works that way. We just hide it really well. No, nope. Ben is skipping some really funny lines. Ooh, Ben doesn't want to acknowledge the movie makes a joke that he would like. So he skips right over them. Uh, Ken like goes to multiple people asking for a job. And he's like, yeah, can I be a lifeguard? I'm a man, so that should be enough. And the guy's like, no, that's not enough. Yeah, can I be a doctor? I'm a man. Look at me. Give me a lab coat. I'll do some doctoring. Uh, what, what do you mean I can't? Don't you see I'm a man? These are jokes that Ben Shapiro would like because the movie is acknowledging that patriarchy is not as complicated as men being in charge the way that women are in Barbie land. Get it? The reality may be portrayed in a hyperbolic sense, but in Barbie land, it's a cartoon world. What they're doing in the real world is acknowledging that while the patriarchy exists and, of course, favors Ken, he doesn't understand that it's more complicated than just men literally get to do everything all the time. What, that, what they're doing there is satirizing Ben Shapiro's critiques of feminism. They're taking people like Ben, who think that feminism is when you believe all men have all the power all the time, and lat, uh, satirizing it by pointing out that no, it still exists, but it's not that complicated. When a guy finally does agree with Ken that the patriarchy exists, it's like a boardroom executive who's like, you know, yeah, we hire women, but we, we, do, our, like, we do our boys stuff a little quieter these days, and they both laugh over it. Uh, this is a real thing that happens in real boardrooms with real corporate executives, where they will hire women as diversity hires to avoid scrutiny, but real power will be kept largely by the men. Uh, we know this for a fact. This is a thing that happens. So what they've done there, uh, I think, is actually pretty excellently lay out the framework of patriarchy that Ken is familiarizing himself with. The world as it exists, but presented in a hyper-real way, and how he comes to terms with it. This is all way too much for Ben Shapiro. Uh huh. Uh huh. Again, you can't even you can't even present the the you know mild other side of the film. And this sort of nonsense continues. The second first mild part of the film others, is about how mild others. What what is that? What? What is the, the men's rights side? Wait, what is he? I don't I don't even know what he means by that. Mattel is kind of bad for creating this fancy land. Second third of the film is about the real world evils of the patriarchy. Oh, the patriarchy. Oh, the patriarchy. Culminating in an idiotic line where one of the low-level members of Mattel is with the board and Barbie is looking for a woman at the board and the low-level man says, I'm a man with no power. Does that make me a woman? <laughs> what Ben Shapiro is pretending to be upset by here is actually the kind of jokes that guys in like the 1970s or something would make. This is like a Mad Men joke. Like, imagine bursting into the Mad Men like ad agency and you're like, is there a lady in here? And then like a beleaguered intern is like, well, I have no power. Does that make me a woman? Like, this is not a woke joke. The joke is like a cynical acknowledgement 
of of women's subservience, but it's not even a feminist line necessarily. Conservatives would make jokes like that. It's just, again, he doesn't know. He doesn't understand. No, you can't parallel park. That's what makes you a woman. In, in any case. See, he just did the... See, like, he he's making fun of the movie for doing a better version of the joke that he just did. Like, he wants to make fun of the movie for doing that, but he also knows that it's a good bit, so he'll do a worse version of it. We, we get here a few obscure jokes about Proust Barbie, because, again, Noah Baumbach has to show that he wrote some of the script. He made a reference to Proust. Doesn't that make him clever? Ooh. Next, you will make... Matt, he's so f***ing mad. He's not a screenwriter, bro. He's so mad. He's like, I would have written a much cleverer line. Make a reference, I would assume, to Victor Hugo. Wow. Proust. Woo. Idiots who think they're smart. It's totally... His, his entire notes... What the f*** is this pause? Ah, uh, okay. Thanks. His entire notes are just him scrawling, like, American Psycho-esque drawings of him murdering uh, Hollywood screenwriters, like, chainsawing them and stuff. Then, Barbie escapes the Mattel building. They were going to package her up, and they were going to send her back to Barbie land. And, uh, and she instead runs and she escapes the Mattel building. And uh, she hooks up... In a very funny and cartoonish escape sequence, by the way. ...with America Ferreira. So America Ferreira is the actual one who's playing with Barbie as a youth. And it's her daughter who Barbie had originally approached. Twist! Okay, and she decides that in order to escape the Mattel executives, she's going to have to bring both of them back to Barbie land. Why should it's a twist, by the way, that acknowledges and makes fun... Not makes fun of necessarily, but calls attention to the mistake that Ben made here. The idea that Barbie is for little girls kind of doesn't track anymore in the modern age of iPhones and iPads. In reality, Barbie is an icon that resonates with the memories of older women who grew up playing with Barbie. That's the demographic, or at least that's the demographic this film is most in acknowledgement of, I would say. Why did she bring both of them back to Barbie Land? No one knows. There's no actual one. There's, there's no explanation as to why she's supposed to bring both of them back to Barbie Land. Supposedly, it's because she needs to escape back to Barbie Land, but she could do that without the two of them. But she decides she's going to bring them back. Um, what? Hold on. Barbie had originally approached. Twist! Okay, and she decides that in order to escape the Mattel executives, she's going to have to bring both of them back to Barbie Land. Why, should, why does she bring both of them back to Barbie Land? No one knows. There's no actual... There's, there's no explanation as to why she's supposed to bring both of them back. I think it's because the mom wanted to. I think that was, I think that was the reason. The mom wanted to go to Barbie Land. That's the reason why. I think they even made a joke about it, like, because I didn't get to go on that cruise the time that I wanted to, she's saying to her daughter, so this time we're doing my thing, let's go. Yeah, she just wanted to show him, because they helped her, they helped Barbie, so that she was like, oh, well, do you want to see this cool paradise that I live in? Like, I'm Barbie, do you want to come back to Barbie Land, this cool paradise for girls? That's it, because they wanted to. Back to Barbie Land. Supposedly, it's because she needs to escape back to Barbie Land, but she could do that without the two of them. But she decides she's going to bring them back. So she brings them back to Barbie Land. Meanwhile, the Mattel How did he miss this? ...are chasing her. Now, question. Why are they chasing her? They achieved their goal. Barbie's back in Barbie Land. Why, 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 are they, why are they still chasing her? No one knows. It doesn't... Because A, she brought humans back, and B, maybe they didn't actually just want to return her to Barbie Land. They wanted her to get in the packaging box. God, it's like he didn't even watch the movie. The packaging box that they wanted to place her in, the implication was that it would have been like a factory reset. It would have reset her memories and her personality to make her quote unquote right again. And the reason she fled wasn't because she didn't want to go back to Barbie land. It was because she thought the box would do something else. They don't just want her back in Barbie land. They want her to no longer be an anomaly. They want her to go back in the box. Like, this isn't, this isn't subtle. It was explicitly, so, okay. It doesn't make any sense. They literally say, there will be consequences you can't even imagine. And then they're like, what consequences? And they're like, uh, uh fill in the blank. And some dude says something about a podcast with two trees. They're like, that's, that's, that's the laziest shitty writing. God, bless He's so mad at screenwriters. He's so mad that they're not dedicating 10 minutes to explaining Will Ferrell CEO Mattel's motivations for putting a human Barbie in a big plastic box. Yeah, the point is that the Mattel executive group is supposed to be a comedic foil. They're a joke. They're goofy. They're literally led by Will Ferrell. I don't know how you're missing this. That's, they're not, their motivations are not to be taken seriously. Okay, anyway, so Ken, in the meantime, he's already headed, while she was, you know, futzing around over at Mattel, Ken is already headed back to Ken, uh, to, to Barbie land, where he has immediately established the patriarchy. So just to, uh, just to point out here, the point of the film is that the matriarchy is amazing. No, that's explicitly not the point of the film at all. And the final minutes of the films that takes place in Barbie Land are a joke at the expense of you for thinking that. Now, women are amazing at everything. Ken walks in and within two seconds, he has taken over all of Barbie Land. And he has turned it into the Kendom. Within, within two seconds. So apparently the women are so unbelievably competent and brilliant and great at everything over in Barbie Land that an idiot man walks in and takes over the whole place inside of two seconds. Fine. So you take they explain this the moment they get back to Barbie Land. 
the moment they get, there's a line that explicitly explains why this happens. Basically, Barbie land is meant to be a conceptual idyllic paradise for Barbies, where women have all the power and all the responsibility. But in Barbie land, they're not humans. They don't die. They don't age. They don't eat. They don't sleep. They're concepts. So when a new concept, uh, an external virus, like say patriarchy gets introduced by Ken, they take it all at face value. Ken basically says, hey, wouldn't you like to stop working for a bit and just like give me beer and you can just like chill in my big mojo dojo casa house for life? Exactly. Um, they're all like, oh, that sounds nice. The same way that I or you would agree to a vacation. They uncritically agree to the framework of a patriarchal society because it's a system against which they have no natural defense. They literally use that line. It's like smallpox on the natives. They have no natural defense. The joke isn't that they're stupid. The joke is that it's something they have an incredible ideological weakness to. This is a joke at the expense of Mattel. Think about it. The idea of Barbie as an uplifting token of female empowerment kind of crumbles when you think about it in the context of the world in which it was created, a world where men rule. The idea is that the stereotypical understanding of Barbie crumbles because it has no natural resistance to the actual ideological uh, uh, contradiction in which it exists, the patriarchy. Does that make any sense? It's basically calling out Barbie as something that is weak and ideologically incapable of dealing with those ideas. It's, it's a joke at the expense. Like, that's the point. They say it. it. Takes over the entire place. We later learned that's because the women, they didn't know what was coming. They, 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 it's, it's, we later learned they didn't have immunity. And the way that they get immunity is by learning to hate the men. They gained immunity by listening to a speech about female empowerment. The speech had literally nothing to do with hating men. Like nothing in at all. They, uh, the, pl the, the Barbies sort of like, uh, uh, foist off their own one by one and they do a speech about how women have it hard but there's a lot of contradictions in a in a you know patriarchal society and that makes them like wake up and remember about their empowerment it has nothing to do with hating men like at all though good you know kudos to ben shapiro for explicitly saying that female empowerment is the same as hating men that's good you got that's the way that they have to learn to hate men okay so ken decides he's gonna go back and he's going to establish his uh, patriarchal system we only learn this when Barbie heads back with America Ferreira and Random Daughter. And, um, and Ken immediately starts acting like the jerks in the patriarchy, right? He calls her baby. Oh, no. He calls her baby. The, the greatest of all insults, he calls her baby. Uh, he also took over their Supreme Court, uh, tried to make it illegal for women to participate in the political process, uh, took over every house, including her own. But yeah, she, he also calls her baby. He does a few other things. I mean, he transforms the entire society in, in like no time at all, and the men now completely rule, and the women are all brainwashed. But... You know, like, yeah, he also calls her baby. And, uh, and then America Ferrer is trying to explain to Barbie what exactly is going on. And she's like, it's just like the indigenous people and smallpox. They had no immunity. Howard Zinn wrote the script. So, so what's the problem with it, Ben? Yeah, I know you're mad at the script writers. Can you explain what the issue is? Because it's actually, uh, it's an analogy that perfectly describes what the movie is trying to explain. It's not at all unclear, even though you seem to have missed it. Can you explain what the issue is? I, I'm telling you, the reason why Ben doesn't like this line is because he doesn't like the idea of his audience being reminded that Native people died of smallpox. They, they don't like any comparisons that acknowledge any kind of suffering of any marginalized people, because to them it's like a woke insertion. Like, the only reason you would say that is to wokely remind people um, that natives died of smallpox. So they, 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 the ladies in Barbie land had no immunity to the magic of the patriarchy. The not, not to the magic, to the idea of the patriarchy, because it was not an idea that existed in their bubble universe. Magic. When women were seduced into... So just to point out here, the actual argument the movie is making is that if women enjoy men, it's because they have been brainwashed by the patriarchy. They make this message explicit. That is not even remotely or slightly what they say. Not even a little bit. The movie never condemns liking men at all. You have to try to miss the point this hard. It is it's remarkable. Like you, the desperation to to make a victim narrative out of men to say the movie hates men on every level is is so palpable. It's the only thing you can think of in just a few minutes in the film. And when I say a few minutes, I mean several years because this film took years off my life. It is long, it is boring, and it's terrible. Okay, so the Kens are about to perform. I have a, none of this makes any damn sense. Okay, the Kens are about to have a vote to change the constitution. Why? Why? Ken literally just sees power. He's a fascist. What the f*** do you know vote for? He's not a fascist, and the point is that the men don't know how to rule, so they're just imitating the mechanisms of power that Barbie controlled beforehand. So 
the vote they were going to have in their court uh, would have been one to cement their power legislatively as opposed to them merely holding it through cultural power. That's it. It's, it was really simple. It's not confusing at all. It's like really, really, really straightforward. Like, it's not an analogy. It's not a metaphor. It's not difficult. Well, why are they voting? Like, he, he seized power. Also, what is the breakdown demographic? You realize that after the Nazis seized power, they also, like, legislated their power judicially, right? Like, the Nazis didn't go, oh, well, we're basically in charge anyway, so there's no point in using any kind of legitimate judicial mechanisms to reaffirm that. W what does any of this mean? I believe the Kens and the Barbies. Are there as many Kens as Barbies? Because why would they hold the vote? The Kens appear to be in a minority in Barbie land. There are a lot more Barbies than Kens. So if that's the case, why even do the Democratic vote thing? Why not just seize the power? Because then you wouldn't have the rest of- They, they, they did seize the power. They are enshrining it in the institutions they took hold of. This happens in real world dictatorships where they will lead a coup to control the courts. And then from the courts, they will legislate it, thus making it law, thus legitimizing their rule. This is not, I don't, I don't understand. This isn't just like a failure in media analysis. This is like a fundamental, in, this is like, I, this is just like, just not understanding stuff. Like stuff doesn't make sense, you know? To the dumb plot of this stupid film. So. They decide they're going to hold the vote. Of course it's dumb to him. He doesn't understand any of it. And not only are they going to hold the vote, they're going to be very fair about it. They're going to hold it in 48 hours. They're going to hold it in a couple of days to make sure that the Barbies have time to actually form a counter plan. Why would they do that? No reason. Asterisk, asterisk. Well, because they're following court sessions. Because What do you mean? They're, the point is to do so through legitimate means. Do you think when dictators seize control of a country, they then have everyone meet to le legitimize the rule like the nanosecond it happens as opposed to waiting for the normal like time for... This is this is like a misunderstanding of very, very basic things in reality. It, it, it's not... This is like, yeah, this is beyond movie analysis. This is just in, like incapability of, of, of understanding the world as it is. He, the, he is as much a fish out of water in the real world as Barbie and Ken were. We'll fill it in later. Okay, so they decide they're going to hold this, this dumbass vote. And the, the Barbies learn about this and they're very, de Barbie is very depressed because Barbie realizes that all the Ooh. other Barbies have been taken in by the patriarchy and this is extremely bad. Now here's one place where you have a serious continuity area in the film. So Margot Robbie, who plays Barbie at the beginning, half the time she plays Barbie is kind of stiff like at all. And half the time she plays Barbie is just kind of normal. No, she played her role stiff at the beginning in the opening montage before she realized she had to travel to the real world. After she uh, goes to the real world, her actions are normal and naturalistic. When she comes back to Barbie land, her actions become stiff and uh, doll-like again when she gives up hope and starts to accept uh, uh, and become complacent within the patriarchy. As in, her adherence to the ideological systems of Barbie land is what makes her act doll-like. It makes perfect sense. It's not... And uh, so now she plays it super stiff like at all. She sits down, you know, in kind of 90 degree position like a Barbie would. And she keels over in the 90 degree position. It was position. very cute. And it would be funny, except she hasn't been doing it the whole film. Yeah, and because she's giving in. The point is that her complacency in these systems is what makes her act, act all like This is like 101 metaphor right here. She acts more doll-like when she is more a pawn of the system. Like, come on. The, the level of inconsistency and bad filmmaking here is just off the charts. They, they, they needed somebody to actually sit down with them and be an adult in the room, and no one was there. So Someone like me. They shouldn't have kicked me out. They needed me right there, and I would have said, no, they, she can't do the, the little bit where she acts like a doll because she didn't do that before, and somebody would explain to him about the metaphor, and he'd be like, that doesn't make any sense. So at this point, America Ferreira and daughter decide they've given up on Barbie because Barbie won't fight for herself, and so they take off. And Michael Sarah, for no reason, is in this film. And he's in the back. That might be true. He might be in the film for no reason. Back of the car. And we don't know why. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused about that. And he serves no purpose other than to have a random fight scene. And also so that they can make a Trump building the wall reference. Right? They, they, they're, they, apparently, the Kens are going to build a wall to keep people from getting in or getting out. Now, here's the weird part. No one has ever entered or exited Barbie land before. Why are you building a wall? What is That is not true. The film explicitly... T for, okay, so for... Oh, my God. So many things are wrong here. First of all, Alan is a pure comedy character. He exists because his existence is funny. It was funny to have him beat up 50 Kens, so that's why it happened. For two, they were building the wall. The, the, the line was they had built one stack of bricks really high on one side of the wall, and they were like, if they ever figure out how to build that wall horizontal, it's over for us. For three, the person who asked the wall to be built was Ken because he didn't want Barbie to leave. Ken, the person who rules this society, loves Barbie and doesn't want her to escape back to the real world, so he wants to build a wall to keep her in. 
That's why. Also, the movie does talk about people having left before. The Mattel people talk about a previous incident where somebody left. But Ken is trying to keep Barbie from escaping. That's why they're building it. You, we watch the movie. This is the necessity for a wall. No one explains. It's just a dumb Trump reference so that everybody who is friends with Noah Baumbach and Greta Gerwig can laugh and nod <laughs> like the morons they are. Mm, it's true. The only people who think that the build the wall joke was funny were the friends of the directors. That's true. Breaking box office records, by the way. And so the daughter and the mom, they decide, no, we have to go back and we have to save Barbie land. They're going to save Barbie land. And who do they go to? They go to wise, weird lesbian Barbie. They go back to Kate McKinnon and they ask her about this. And they bring Barbie with them. And they're going to try to figure out a strategy. How do they stop the Kens from winning the vote? Now, you might say to yourself, wait, um, aren't the women a uh, majority? Do they not have agency, the women? They have no agency, apparently. So apparently No, they don't. That's the point. Barbie land is an idea space. And under the patriarchy, they have been stripped of their agency as a property of the patriarchy. The, the, the world they exist in, they're not humans. They're representations of ideas. If the idea in Barbie land is one of a patriarchy, a consequence of that is that they all lose agency and become complacent because those are the values that patriarchy imposes on women. That's, that's the point. That's the point. That's the point. Apparently the women have no agency and they are a majority and yet they have to be deprogrammed. They're going to be deprogrammed by weird Barbie and her, and her crazy cadre of feminist heroes. <laughs> No, they're actually going to be deprogrammed by the mom. Uh, I forget the name of the character. Uh, the human mom who came over because the human mom has had actual real world experience with patriarchy and as such is um, frustrated with uh, uh, contradictory expectations of women under patriarchy. And her talking about that is what makes Barbie snap back to it because now they've been given an ideological inoculation to patriarchy. See? It's the same metaphor as before. See, they had no resistance to patriarchy because they're an idea space and that idea had never been exposed to them. But a contrary idea, which is feminist critique, is introduced to them, which exists as an inoculation, thereby giving them agency within a patriarchal system. It's almost like they exist in a cartoon world where their ideas are what shape the reality they exist in. <laughs> oh, I love you guys. And this is when we start getting into the real, the real, pro uh, you think it's propagandistic so far? Oh man, wait, here is where we get into like the real meat of it. Okay, so we end up with Barbie complaining. She's complaining to weird Barbie. And she says, oh my God, they've brainwashed all the other Barbies. They've brainwashed all the other Barbies. She says, quote, either you're brainwashed or you're weird and ugly. There is no in between. And weird Barbie says, tell me about it. And this is the perspective of the film. Either you're a third wave feminist kook who hates men, truly hates men, or you are brainwashed. No. The joke there was that in a patriarchal society, you would only be considered to be one of those two things, which is doubly funny because Ben Shapiro is now making the point of the movie. The argument being made there is under patriarchy, you can either be complacent or you can be a deviant, which gets you called, you know, an ugly or whatever that the other. The argument is that there are unfair standards placed on women, which Ben is perfectly reaffirming here by calling them man-hating, when nothing they do or say indicates man-hating. The movie shows countless instances of men being horrible, but at no point do they arrive at an ideological conclusion that men are bad. The movie rejects man-hating as a concept or as a potential solution. So Ben's making the point here by being a sexist, he's sort of reaffirming the idea. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. There's no in between. There's no actual relationship between men and women. There can't be any sort of fulfilling relationship between men and women. There this are no is never even remotely said. He's just making stuff up. Decent males in the entire film. All the men are garbage. The only man who even appears mildly is America for his husband, who's just kind of a joke. He's there for literally 10 seconds in the film making jokes about how he can't speak Spanish. That's also, the men aren't all bad in the movie. The Kens aren't portrayed as bad. The Kens, there are comments made in the movie where they acknowledge the fact that the Kens are treated as an underclass. At one point, Barbie even says that she doesn't know where they sleep because all of the houses in Barbie land are for Barbies, which implies that Kens literally just sleep in the cold on the beach. The movie explicitly points out that Barbie Land is an ideological matriarchy and plays with that idea and acknowledges it. The movie never arrives at the conclusion that men are bad. And in fact, sympathetic explanations are given to why they did what they did vis-a-vis -vis the whole Ken revolution thing. What about Alan? Eh, Alan's just Alan. That's, that's, his whole, that's his whole role in the film. 
every other man is a piece of shit in the film. Everyone. I mean, so that is not true. In fact, after the Ken revolution ends, one of the Kens is like, hey, girl, do you want to be my girlfriend? And she's like, yeah, there's no hatred held towards them. There's 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 no like antipathy. In fact, the, the men and the women are flirting constantly in 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 Ken's world. This is the perspective of the film when you come right down to it. Either you are brainwashed or you are weird and ugly. No, that is the perspective of the film from the perspective of Ben. From patriarchs like Ben, you are either brainwashed into their system, though he wouldn't call it brainwashed, of course, because he's the one advocating for it, or weird and ugly, i.e., hey, guys, how many times has Ben Shapiro characterized feminists as weird and ugly? That's my point. And Barbie's like, yeah, that's what Barbie says. I mean, the only decent male is Alan, who apparently wants to wear pink and probably is supposed to be gay. I mean, he's not really framed as... If anything, Alan is a metaphor for non-binary identities. The, the Ken and Barbie are both sexless. Literally, they're dolls. So we're really talking about like conceptual identities here. It doesn't matter. Alan's just a joke character. Whatever. I think it's supposed to be pretty clear from the film. Although, really, the take of the film is that all the Kens are gay. That's that's really the take of the film is that it's all homoerotic kind of stuff. Let's be the patriarchy is kind of homoerotic for one, and also all of the Kens are independ independently courting Barbies. None of them are gay. They are all going after Barbies. This is just a total misread of the story. Oh. Anyone who wants to beach him off has to beach me off first. I will beach both of you off at the same time. Oh. In, in any case, the filmmaker- Also, that's a joke. That they're doing a joke there. You know straight guys do shit like that all the time, right? Like, literally. You can go to, like, a sports team and all the straight guys are playing dick tug over there where they tug each other's dicks as hard as they can. Gay- Straight men are gay as fuck, okay? Let's, let's not pretend that they're a gay allegory. They all look and act straight are so insecure with even their own script that they then have the narrator jet in to say, Margot Robbie might not be the best person to make this point, right? Because Barbie's saying, I don't feel beautiful anymore. And they're like, Margot Robbie, they literally jet in to say, Margot Robbie might not be the best person to make this point. Then maybe you shouldn't have written the point. Oh my God. One of the best jokes in the film, by the way, um, Barbie feels bad and she says, I don't feel pretty. And then the narrator steps in and says, note to directors, Margot Robbie, not the best person to cast to make this point. No jokes after the first minute in the film, by the way. He didn't identify this. He did maybe maybe Ben Shapiro thinks that was like an actual like mistake in the film, like it like a edit that was left out, you know, that should have removed that. Like that was like a little print error, you know? I don't know how else to interpret it. This is very stupid. And maybe you shouldn't write it like that. Maybe you should not be a <laughs> shit writer. Dude, pretty women never say I don't feel pretty. Um, and if you ever have them say that, it's because you're a bad writer, even if you directly address it and use it to make a joke that makes lots of people in my theater specifically laugh. It's actually bad writing because because that's illogical. Um, you you claim, excuse me, miss, you claim that you uh, don't feel pretty when you are objectively very pretty uh, and looking quite fertile. Um, who wrote this, Drek? Excuse me. Maybe you could do that. Okay, no. Okay, this is when we get the full bore thesis of the film. Mm -hmm. And guess what, guys? The, the thesis of the film, made by women, made for women, uh -huh. made starring women, funded. Uh -huh by a studio that's true. that is largely staffed by men. Uh -huh. Yes, that's, oh, it's, well, I, I wonder about that. Mm. Artistic projects made and staffed by women still exist under the economic purview of male uh, domination. It's interesting. I wonder if there was a, a movie that made that point a little, <laughs> a little recently, but you know. The take of the film is that it is impossible to be a woman in the modern age. Impo absolutely impossible. And so we get this long, speech of America for talking about how it's oh, so- Oh, this is going to be rough for Ben because he's going to do the, well, you claim it's impossible, but there are women in the real world. It's a speech on inconsistencies in the experience of a woman, how you're expected to be this and that at the same time, blah, blah. It's not about how it's literally impossible. It's about how it's impossible to meet all these expectations, which is true. So oh, difficult to be a woman. They want us to be this way, but not that way. They want us to be thin, but they don't want us to say that we're thin. They want us to earn money, but they don't want us to earn money. They want us to do this, and they don't want us to do that. They want us to answer for men's bad behavior, but they don't want us to offend men. They want us to do this, and they don't want us... Oh my God, it's so difficult to be a woman. So the same tried, truistic bullshit that they've been propagating in every new wave feminist film for the last... Wow, it's almost like it's feminist critique. Wow, why do they keep bringing up this same set of arguments in all of these feminist movies? Uh, he doesn't have a counter argument to these, of course, by the way. He's just because he's his editor is trying to appeal to young people because grooming is like the modus operandi of YouTube conservatives who have a lot of money behind them. Um, they're going to they're going to like, here's some sad music and here's some black and white. Don't actually engage with the idea. Just think that it's bad and leave it at that. 45 years in the United States is now is now essentially telescoped into this one speech from America Ferrer, including a few cutaway shots of Margot Robbie looking up adoringly at America Ferrer as she explains that it's super hard to be a woman. It's so.
You're talking the mic. So damn difficult to be a woman. You know why? Because of the patriarchy, because of the men. That's the actual story of the film. And then they make a couple of other dumb- Yeah, that is, mm-hmm. How, I cannot believe this Barbie movie ended up being about feminism. That's crazy. References, right? The Zack Snyder cut. The, the men, they like the Zack Snyder cut. Wow, that's, that's terrible. Okay, fine. Then they say, you know they what do. we need to do? We need to disabuse all of these Barbies of the patriarchy. How are we going to do this? We need to, we need to allow them to live with the cognitive dissonance required to be a woman under the patriarchy. That's a line from Barbie. Huh? Now again, they keep doing this. They keep having Barbie drop these extremely literate and well-articulated lines, but she's supposed to be a plastic doll idiot. She's, she's not. Okay, this is a different Barbie from a different piece of media. This is a, not the Barbie movie, parentheses 2023. Um, I, I just like how Ben is like the worst guy to make these arguments because he's a sexist, which makes it really difficult for him to critique the points made by the film without just rolling his eyes and going, uh, women. Authority should derive from the consent of the governed, not from the threat of force. Okay, first of all, don't copyright me. Second of all, um, yeah, the joke here is also that she knows words. It doesn't matter. What is their actual strategy? Okay. So they have, they have 48 hours to stop this vote, which shouldn't be happening in the first place because it makes no plot sense. Because the men are fascists and the women it are- Makes no plot sense. Fa fascists never use legal institutions to legitimize their rule. That's not a real thing that happens. Don't look at any, any country ever in all of history. That never happens. Are victims. But somehow they've been given 48 hours to stop the vote. So what are they going to do to stop this vote? How are they going to do it? Well, they're going to separate the men and the women. Barbie! They're going to turn all the Barbies against the Kens. It's so subtle, the symbol- No, no, wait, no? They're gonna turn the Kens against the Kens. The plan was to de-brainwash all the Barbies by, explain, by, by giving the speech on the patriarchy, and then once all the Barbies were unbrainwashed and, and, and willing to talk again, they make the Kens jealous and combative with each other, so they all fight rather than voting. Is so subtle. Turn all the women against the men and you will save society. No, no, they weren't turned against the men. They were given an inoculation against patriarchal logic. That was the point. That's the message that you could be shoveling directly into the brain of your eight-year-old girl, if you so choose, this weekend. Hmm. He really likes talking about eight-year-old girls. Maximum volume. Stop copywriting me. <laughs> Stop copywriting so, um, me. They literally say this. Get the Barbies away from their cans. How are they going to achieve this? Well, they're going to make the men complacent and then take their power. This is how women have achieved power. Now, let me just digress briefly here in how women actually- No? The plan was for every individual Barbie they were going to de-brainwash, they would distract one Ken, take away the Barbie that he was with, explain to the Barbie the feminist logic, they would be inoculated, and then they would go on to do the same for another one. Then, once all the Barbies were on the same team, they would uh, bait the Kens into jealously fighting with each other, so they would all be fighting on the day when they were supposed to vote in the Supreme Court. ...actually achieved power in Western civilization. The answer is that they lobbied men and men gave it to them. That is the actual answer as to how women achieve power in Western civilization. That's true. Think nothing of the fact that women didn't have that power to begin with. Um, you know? This would be like saying, how did black people achieve power in Western civilization? Well, white people gave it to them. Okay, who took it away to begin with? Quick question. Wait, follow. Wait, hold on. I'm sorry. Okay, so I, I get white people voted to end slavery. That's great. But um, who took it away to begin with? Who, who was maintaining the lack of power there? Right. No, that is literally what he's saying. The amendment to the Constitution that allowed women to vote was passed solely by men. Because wow, crazy. How could women have possibly voted for it? Well, he's like, bro, in this institution where only men are allowed, only men voted to pass the... Wow, really? Damn, only, it, it, only men voted for women's suffrage in a system without women's suffrage? That's f crazy, bro. This is like, seriously, people, this is like the conservative intellectual. This is like, people, people hold this guy up as like a, as like an icon of, of conservative intelligentsia. But every minute of this has been agony. Genuine agony. Yeah, you forget how stupid he is. Because women couldn't vote. It turns out there are a lot of good-hearted men out there who like women and who want women to be able to live lives that they want. It turns out that many of us, our husbands and fathers, many of us- See, again, his only narrative here, the only thing he wants to reaffirm is male aggrievement. It's pathetic, you know? No, no matter what the narrative, even the narrative of women being legally disallowed from voting, this has to be a story about how nice men are. Oh, sure, men were the ones who kept them from voting in the first place. They were the ones who created the institutions that prevented women from voting and only guaranteed voting for men. 
But, you know, then they change their mind 150 years later. So, yeah, it's really all about them. Yeah, it's baby brain shit. And it's all about making men feel like they're the aggrieved victim. All the worthless low-T beta males who watch Ben Shapiro and get their arguments from him, it's to make them feel like they personally are the gracious patrons of women and blacks alike. How all the criticisms of systemic inequality are just people being too ingracious to all the kindness that his gender showed them. Let's have daughters. And race. Many of us love the people we're married to. It turns out that that actually describes a huge number of Western men, that we are not your enemies. Okay. And yet the entire Movie premise of the movie is that what are. actually happened in the feminist movement is that women seize the power away from the men. That's just not what the film is going for or what it says. I'm sorry to break it to you, ladies. It ain't true. It ain't true. And this notion that women vote as a block is not true. Married women vote very much like their husbands, actually. Uh, wouldn't that be husbands vote a lot like their wives? Hmm. Single women vote more like a block now than they did before. But it turns out that People are individuals, and some women vote one way, and some men vote another way. What does this have to do with Barbie? But again, the idea here is very simplistic. Men versus women. Battle royale. It's, that's not, it's not. The women and men don't battle. That's not what happens at the conclusion of the film. That's what this literally turns into, a battle royale between the women and the men, but really- No, between the men and the men. You, you, this is it. This scene we're looking at right here is not that, this is from the beginning of the movie. The end is the men fighting the men. getting the men to fight each other. They bring all the Barbies one by one. They distract them. They bring the Barbies in one by one and they unbrainwash them. How do they unbrainwash them? Well, they tell them truths like any power you have must be masked under a giggle. Yeah, they, the feminist thing. We've already gone over this. The feminist critique. Yeah. I have a question. I mean, I work with a lot of women. Do they feel like the power that they have has to be masked under a giggle? Was this film written in 1943? Who wrote this film? And well, we know who wrote this film. A feminist. A feminist writer. Incre wow. What a, what a shock. Incredible. A feminist writer has feminist critiques written into a feminist movie where they say things that are true, of course, feministly. Who gets paid millions of dollars to make horse mm -hmm. One of them says, you have to reject men's advances without damaging their ego. Or theoretically, you could just reject men's advances and damage their ego because- Oh yeah, that's something women- that This is how you know that Ben Shapiro's audience is 99% men. Oh yeah, women have never felt any lingering anxiety about rejecting men's advances and worrying about how it comes off to the men. That's not something that women are scared of all the time when rejecting men. You know, I ah, know it's true. It's this is this is a lesson that can only resonate with men. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons why, uh, again, fascism has trouble propagating itself, because if you have a political narrative based almost entirely on the myth of male aggrievement, it's really difficult to pull women over, which is why women overwhelmingly have a, like, bias towards voting Democrat. What do you care? Not overwhelmingly, I should say, but it's a significant distinction between men and women. You have to pretend to be confused about money. Is this a real thing? Like, do women pretend to be confused about money so men will explain it to them? Literally, yes. I still, I, I, I am publicly a feminist, and I still go on dates with women who pretend to know less than they do because they're used to doing this with men. Like, this has happened to me my entire life. That, that... This is also uh, it's such claptrap. And, yeah, and then so, my, it's my very clap. favorite. Do you want some pants? Because that's really what this is about, is women really, really want to wear pants. That demonstrates the, the power of the patriarchy is that men really don't want women to wear pants, and women really, really want to wear pants. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what he's going for here. Love your leg warmers. Stop. Nice ascot. And then it's, you know, all the men. Whoa, how could they make that joke in a kid's movie? Grooming, grooming. What about the eight-year-old who was watching Toy Story? They can't say leg warmers ascot being victimized, all the Kens being victimized by these various tactics, up to and including Ryan Gosling hitting on a trans woman, meaning a dude who has a voice deeper than- Ah, uh, that's, tr oh, that's tragic, man. Oh, all the harm done by Ryan Gosling hitting a trans woman. Oh. As if Ben Shapiro, like all these conservative pundits, don't wank it to uh, trans girl porn all the time when they're not on camera. Than Ryan Gosling, which is an actual scene in the film, which is, which is just great. It's great. It's great. Uh, mainstream blockbusting Hollywood movie with a with a, a, a prominent trans person being hit on by Ryan F Gosling. Oh no! Oh, I'm <laughs> oh I'm heaving at how oh, just mask. Look at the look at that hairy body and they're what seven feet tall. What the f are you talking about? Jesus Christ! It's like they want you to live in a fantasy world where Ryan Gosling hitting on a person who looks like this is meant to be some kind of punishment. I'm not not even addressing the fact that um, Barbie can't even be trans in Barbie Land. They don't have genitals. I don't know what I don't I don't know what Ben thinks transness would mean in Barbie Land for a concept that isn't a person. So I I guess like the, so be be reminded by the way that 
because she's not thought of as trans in universe, because that wouldn't even make conceptual sense, the logic that Ben Shapiro is putting forward here is that even having a trans actress, even if the character themselves isn't trans, is disgusting. So uh, this is the so this is the social pathogen logic that the Nazis would do with the Jew, where their hatred of a group is so irrational that it exists outside any like contextual space they initially frame their hatred in. If because remember the dislike of trans women being women from the conservative lens is supposed to be a matter of genitals, but in this case it's a genitalless character being played by an actor. There are two levels of abstraction that separate this person from transness, and still Ben Shapiro frames Ryan Gosling flirting with her as a punishment narratively for Ryan Gosling. This is literally like the stuff that gets people in minority groups compared to rats, you know. Um, it is, it is the, the, the hatred existing through that abstraction is how like the Nazi narrative at first was the Jews and financial organizations did this. And then it was just the Jews. Then it was anything Jewish ish, which is like Judeo Bolshevism or like anything we consider Jewish. And then it's like anything even remotely associated. Uh, and, and basically what I'm saying is that, uh, Ben Shapiro would have, uh, agreed with the Nazis and still does. And final step. Finally, the women have been disabused. So now they're going to play the ultimate prank. The ultimate prank is that they are going to turn the men against each other. How are they going to turn the men against each other? They're going to turn the men against each other by switching partners. Hmm. They're going to get together and Barbie is going to be with Ken, classic Barbie and classic Ken. They're going to be together. But what? then they're going to no move on to the other Kens and the Kens are going to start fighting each other over the ladies because they're going to, to switch over. Now, um, not, to, uh, not to put too fine a point on this, but this makes no sense at all because guess what? They... They were all at a campfire at the beach, all the Barbies and Kens, and basically while being sang to by the Kens, the Barbies all pretended to be like interested in something another Ken said, and they all talked to the other Ken. The point was just to make all the guys petty and jealous with each other. This is a thing that happens in real life. Uh, I don't know what the problem is. What would happen if a bunch of beautiful women decided to switch to other men simultaneously? You know what the men would do? They would throw a party. So they turned. What? What? If you were flirting with a girl and you loved her and you took her to a date by the beach and you were singing to her and then mid you singing to her, she looked at her phone, laughed and then went to go talk to another man without explaining to you what they had done. Dude, I'm I'm not even monogamous and I would get you that, that that's just rude. What do you mean? Is the joke that he hates women? What's the joke here? The men against each other. And then we get a 20 minute long segment. Wait, no, wait, are we, can, can we explain that? What do you what do you mean? What, what, what do you mean they would throw a party if all the women they loved d d d indicated casual disinterest by, like, flirting with other guys in front of them? Is, is this him talking about a cuck fetish? Like, he's like, well, if I, if I was with my beautiful wife and then my wife laughed and left me and went to talk to some other muscular man, I, I would throw a party because yeah, I'd get to watch. What are you talking about? Of the Kens fighting each other using various implements ranging from, like, small bows and arrows with sticky cups at the end to, uh, to tennis rackets. Yes, it's, it's a joke universe. At one point, two Kens, as you can see, have kind of like a Kamehameha off where they both flex at each other so hard they explode. And that turns into a musical number. I'm just kidding, Don't copyright me, please. I'm begging you to not. This is such a long video with so much copyright material that I am examining uh, with fair use in mind to create a distinct creative purpose separate from both the movie and Ben Shapiro's video. What does any of this have to do with the plot? Nothing. Literally nothing. It's just a 15 minute digression because they want- What, what does the climax of the movie have to do with the plot? What? Th this distraction is how they take Barbie Land back from the Kens and the movie, the, the, the music video at the end was giving us an insight into Ken's emotional state and the reasons why he had done what he did so that, that we could arrive at the emotional conclusion with Barbie and him talking? It's the climax of the movie and of the character arc. I wanted to insert a crappy musical number with not particularly good dancing. It, okay. And then what are the women? Yeah, I thought people liked it. During, during this time, the women are voting. The women are voting. So now we know the Democratic turnout strategy. The Democratic turnout strategy in 2024 is going to be to get all of the Republicans to fight with one another using tennis rackets. Well, true, unironically. They go and they do the voting, apparently. So they, they go and they vote. After they vote, they reestablish exactly basically how it was. The matriarchy. The matriarchy is reestablished. Please, the copyright material. Please, please. And Ken, please, 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 please. Who is please. now really sad because he has lost his power. And all he wanted in the first place was just to be treated decently by Barbie. 
Is he treated decently at the end by Barbie? Hold on. He didn't just want to be treated decently by Barbie. She didn't do- Oh, this is another funny thing! Okay, all Barbie did to Ken was rebuke his interest. But Ben is saying she mistreated him. See? In the feminist rant, he was like, what do you mean women are worried about the way men perceive their rejections? And then she, by just rejecting him, and he's like, well, why'd you do that, you stupid bitch? It's literally the thing. It's actually the thing. Barbie wasn't mean to Ken. She invited him over. She just didn't particularly care about him. You're literally validating the movie. You're reaffirming the arguments. Of course he isn't. That would be silly. At the very end, he is told that he needs to learn to live without Barbie. Yes, that's a good lesson. He was, it was a one-sided relationship where he spent decades pining for her without reciprocation. That's the good, literally, he's like, he's like, how can feminists possibly argue that women, oh, just women, just reject men. Why do you care if you hurt their feelings? And then he's like, uh, why doesn't she just live with him and marry him? She, he clearly wants her. Like, it's, he doesn't know. I just don't know who I am without you. You're 10. Please, but it's Barbie. And Ken. Stop. There is Stop. no just Stop. Ken. Stop. He who was literally created as a doll to be with Barbie, he needs to learn to be apart from Barbie and she needs to learn to be apart from him because atomistic isolation and loneliness is the best way to find- Holy shit. This is literally like the incel conclusion. Dude, she wasn't interested in him. Are you seriously arguing that the conclusion should have been Barbie just accepting that being with Ken was inevitable and just been with him? You know, the lesson here is literally Ken should be self, uh, should be independent and self-actualized without the affirmation of one specific woman. And, and Bar Ben's like, no, actually, I actually think she should have just given up. She owed him love. That's actually what he's saying here. He is arguing that he wasn't ken -uff. And Fulfillment, ladies and gentlemen. It'll be best for Ken if he never sees Barbie again. It'll be better for Barbie if she never sees Ken again. Did they, yeah, well, well, she leaves to go to the human world, so um, they, they do separate. Uh, but yeah, he should probably form his own identity outside of just being desperate for attention. That's probably a good idea. This is another example of how um, right-wing answers to the incel epidemic can never actually fix the problem because underlying the incel attitude, especially the conservative incel attitude, it are the, the, the emotional and ideological uh, uh, biases that lead to the problem to begin with. Killer humanism is at its finest. We've reached the apotheosis. Men and women don't belong together. They belong very, very much apart. No, the end of the movie has the Kens and Barbies living together, and there's even scenes where the Kens and Barbies, like, date and get with each other like right at the end right after the whole ken barbie thing there's a ken and a barbie and they're like hey want to get together like, yeah sure like there's that's not even remotely the lesson here this is all topped off by uh Issa Rae calling somebody a mother again perfect for your seven-year-old girl who mm -hmm. loves yep back to this again mm -hmm. loves barbie dolls just perfect for her mm -hmm. and so we learned that you can say one in pg-13 movies men and women are supposed to be separate they are not supposed to be together and that maybe not the matriarchy the will allow the men not to be on the Supreme Court of, of Barbie land, but maybe they can get some lower circuit court judgeships. This is what we learn. And yeah, the joke at the end of the movie is that after the whole revolution business, they're now going to give Ken's power in government the same amount of power women have in the real world. So the joke was, oh, okay, we'll do equality like the real world. But because it's Barbie land, the genders are reversed. So it's still a matriarchy because... The Barbie land is literally an ideological reflection of the status of the real world. It's a projection of attitudes that are put into it. So their equality is imitating the real world, just reversed because it's Barbie land. It's a joke, but it's in a joke. It's a joke that acknowledges inequality. And we learn one day the Kens might have as much power and influence in Barbie world as women have in the real world. Yeah, that's, that's the joke. The joke acknowledges the inequality of the Kins while pointing out the existence of the patriarchy in the real world and makes fun of both by having a solution that isn't really one, but is still better. And that is the joke, the concessions, the small benefits. Because of course, women are, are again, just absolutely subjugated in the real world. You think that- Hey, whoa, notice how, uh, hey, 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 guys, 
Remember how just a couple minutes ago, Ben Shapiro was like, women should be grateful that men voted to give them suffrage. And now for some reason, he's not like, Ken should be grateful that the Barbies voted to give them suffrage, which they literally did in the movie. That was what happened. Interesting how his weird paternalistic, you should be grateful for any rights you're given, even if they're fewer than ours, doesn't translate over when men are the ones in a disadvantaged position. The cognitive dissonance you have to operate under here is insane. That's the end of the movie. Wrong. This thing has more endings than Lord of the Rings. So ending number one is oh? we find out that Ken is going to live apart from Barbie and he's going to find himself in being Ken. Ugh, oh, the utter joy of self-exploration. Yeah. Yes. What are, what are you, a f demon? What do you, what? Yes. Okay. Yes. Next, we get an ending in which the CEO of Mattel who's been completely sidelined. You remember the CEO of Mattel? Remember he was supposed to be chasing them into Barbie yeah, Land? Yeah, he wasn't no an important reason. character. So he's now in Barbie Land. We don't know why he's there or what he's there to do, except that we- He came there to get Barbie, to rid Barbie of the anomaly that led to the problems, and they're not framed heavily because they're mostly side joke characters whose plot isn't that relevant to what happens. We need Will Ferrell in the movie to provide no laughs. He doesn't provide any laughs. So he shows up. I like His Will motivation Ferrell. throughout this movie has been completely inconsistent. He started off wanting to put Barbie back in Barbie Land so that they can make money. And then he's the told box. at one point that when Kens have taken over Kendom, they will make just as much money. He's like, no, I, that cannot be. I'm an ideologue on behalf of women. And then he arrives and he is told that, that America Ferrera wants to make ordinary Barbie, which, by the way, would sell zero. Anyway. Thanks. Literally taking the position of the sexists in the movie. Again, like why he can't critique this movie is because it would require examination of any of the biases that he has. That will be profitable and so keep in mind he says it would sell zero but he's also saying this movie is going to bomb keep in mind that he recorded this right after the movie came out and before it started hitting these records so he recorded this like well it'll do okay at the box office but then it'll fall apart and um it has uh, uh and it has been doing uh, uh pretty pretty f great has it broken 500 million yet in less than a week it passed 400 million two days ago now he wants to make ordinary barbie because he's back to being uber capitalist evil capitalists who's making money off of Barbie because again, Mattel are the bad guys, but they're also the good guys, but they're kind of the bad guys, but they're mostly the good, but they're a little bad. And they're neither the bad guys nor the good guys. They're a comedic frame of the company and a way of representing the internal hypocrisy in their ideas. They are money interested and insincere when they claim to be feminist, but there is still some sort of like, um, uh, I emotional enthusiasm for women's products specifically. The point is that they're inconsistent and bumbling. They're a joke entourage. Every time they're on screen, jokes are being made. They're not a consistent character in terms of ideology because it doesn't matter. And so that's ending number number two at this point. So we have the Barbie Ken ending. We have the CEO of- the. Okay, the these aren't ending. This is why you can't be a screenwriter. These aren't endings. These are conclusions to arcs. That's not the same as an ending. An ending is when you have something that seems to be the end of the movie, and then the movie continues, and then that happens again, and then that happens again. That was the Lord of the Rings trilogy. That's how that ended. You're just describing the ends of arcs of characters. These arcs didn't end in ways that implied the end of the movie. Tell ending. Where he says, we'll make ordinary Barbie, and then girls all over the world will know that ordinariness is fine and okay. Because it's not that girls play with Barbie because they think that she's beautiful and it's aspirational. No, it's, it's bad. Okay, so then we have ending number three. And it, we, you think you're done? Wrong. We're now two hours deep into this piece of shit. And we, we have now dug halfway to China. These aren't, these aren't endings. None of these felt like endings. They were just a character arc being resolved. And we are going to keep digging. So we have ending number three. I also like how Ben is again reinforcing the point of the movie where he thinks that the only thing that's supposed to be aspirational about Barbie is the beauty. Because the whole point of ordinary Barbie was that they were an ordinary person and not like a doctor or an airline pilot or whatever. But when 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 you ask like, well, hey, Ben Shapiro, why do you think a girl um would like Barbie? He's like, well, because they're beautiful. Why else? And then like, that's it. Because again, like, you know, he's, he's sexist. Yeah. Perlman shows up to lecture us all about the patriarchy again. You haven't heard it enough. We got to beat this sucker into the ground. We are going to take an axe, the blunt end of the axe, and we're just going to beat this thing to death. Yeah, the movie is about feminist critique. It will feature in it extensively. Um, I'm sorry that you get triggered by feminist critique. It makes sense for a movie that is about it to contain a lot of it, you know? Like, this would be like arguing about how much racial politics there is in 12 Years a Slave. You know, like, well, we, we get it. He's a slave. We understand. You beat us over the head in the beginning, and you beat us over the head in the middle, and now at the end, still, you're going to beat us over the head with it. Like, yo, thank, yes, that's what the movie's about. Thank you. 
I'm just going to beat it to death. Yep. So, <laughs> <Rhea> <laughs> <Perlin> <laughs> <shows> <laughs> <up>. <laughs> <And> Barbie, <laughs> it turns out, she spent too much time in the real world. That was the patriarchy and was terrible. So terrible that she wanted to stop it from happening in Barbie land. But now she wants to go back there because she actually learned some feelings over in, over in the real world. So she doesn't like being a doll. She likes the idea of being able to grow and change. She specifically says in a line that I find quite uh, meaningful that she doesn't want to be an idea. She wants to be the one who makes the ideas. Uh, I think that's a pretty compelling argument for being a human over being a doll personally. So she decides that after all, this whole story was just Pinocchio, that she just wants to be a real boy. And in what can only be termed a sort of bait and switch, at the very end of- This was set up since the beginning when she saw the old woman at the bus stop and all the pain and joy humans felt. There's a point early on in the movie where Barbie is sitting at a bus stop and she turns to look at a woman next to her who must be like 85, she's ancient. And, um, Barbie is looking very sentimental and is just sort of reflecting on the world that she's in. And after a brief pause, she says, you're beautiful. And the old woman says, I know it. The, the, the movie is deeply humanist in a way that Ben must hate because he's a demon. Uh, you know, he, so that must like really, really grind his, uh, his gears. But it's, um, it hits on these points pretty consistently. Where the things that Barbie values are change and growth in human experience, not being consistently beautiful. Mattel wanted them to cut that scene, but they fought to keep it. That's based. Is that true, Tempest? That's based. Of the film. Just to please the core audience, which is moms and daughters, they insert a bunch of footage, I kid you not, like home video footage of moms and daughters playing. That's what it is. Like people living their lives in female ways because Rhea Perlman is going to show. So Barbie is about women. So they show women but the scene isn't for little girls. I don't think the scene would have made sense to little girls. Guys, the scenes they show of mothers and daughters and of women broadly grow in age. It's not just about seeing mothers and daughters. It's about seeing humans die. That's the end of this movie. Barbie has a conversation with her creator and her creator essentially says, if you want to be a human, this is what it means. It means a lifetime of feeling and then you die. And Barbie says, well, yeah, that's what I want. It's a legitimately good scene. It's a humanist one. And it's one that Ben could never understand because he's a demon. Show Barbie what it's like to be a human. And then Barbie is going to say that she really wants to be a human just like you, just like you. No, the, the woman doesn't want Barbie to become a human. Barbie says she wants to become a human. And the woman, Ruth, says, I can't in good conscience let you make this decision without knowing what it means. And then she projects into Barbie's mind a vision of death. And it's meant to be a deliberate contrast from the beginning of the movie. Because in the beginning of the movie, Barbie is knocked out of her dull, dreamlike state by having irrepressible thoughts of death. But at the end of the movie, the thought of living a human life and then dying is something that makes her feel comfortable. The whole, the whole arc of the movie is about her growing and changing to a point where she's so set on the experience and on the value of that experience that it's not something that causes her anxiety anymore. It, there's so much meaning that he's just leaving on the table there because he's so stupid. This guy couldn't write screenplays for a puppet theater. He, he doesn't know anything. And so they hit you with the nostalgia play at the very end. The whole movie, which should have been nostalgia and about moms and daughters, instead, the entire movie is not that. The entire movie is instead about how men are evil and terrible. It's not and also Mattel is evil and terrible. What the movie's about. And then at the very end, they shove in this little nostalgia play in the hope that they can buy back the audience at the very end. It's of not nostalgia. She's envisioning her own death. It's not nostalgia. They're not even scenes of mothers and daughters playing with Barbies. It's a scene where she's thinking of her own mortality. Of the film. And Barbie decides that she is going to be a real woman now. Now, when she goes, that, that's ending number three. There's still one more. So. When that happens, these aren't endings. These are just conclusions of character arcs. And this isn't even the conclusion of her character arc because Barbie's in the next scene too. And there's more. When she goes to, when, when she goes into this white area that's supposed to be heaven because the person who she's taught, Rhea Perlman, is actually the person who actually created the doll. Wait, this already happened. Supposed to be this Wait, did he mix it up? The whole scene we've been discussing is the scene of her talking to Ruth. The way, no, no, he's mixing it up. He's saying that that happened and then this happened. They happened at the same time because they're the same scene. So this was supposed to be a secret. Is the Mattel was run by men, but the big secret all along is that a woman created the doll. News. That's, that's not, not a secret. She that's not it. That's not framed as a secret at all. They joke. They're like, yeah, we have the ghost of the person who made Barbie on like floor 13 of the headquarters. It wasn't framed as a secret even remotely. 
who's CEO of the company for 30 years. They, they mention it directly. See, they explicitly state at the first Mattel scene that they had a female CEO in the 70s. This isn't a secret. They just say it. It's not. Oh, my God, man. Oh, my God. CEO of Mattel for 30 years, like 1945 to 1975, until the IRS caught her for tax evasion or something. The they said that in the movie. They said that. They made jokes about her doing tax evasion. They made two jokes about it. They were funny. Reveal that the patriarchy said that it created Barbie. It didn't. No one thought the patriarchy. They, no, nobody did. They knew it was a woman who did it. They, they, it's not a secret. What do you mean? It's not. It's a... Create Barbie. Again, don't bother with the This would be like a biopic on Martin Luther King Jr. And he dramatically shows up 15 minutes into the movie where it reveals that he's black. And then Ben pauses. Like, yeah, they really thought it was a secret that Martin Luther King Jr. was black. Everyone knew he was black. And it's just like a scene where he walks forward and they see him and he's black. Like, literally, that's the level of, like, brain damage we're operating on right now. Holy shit. He literally would do that, though. Yeah. Facts. Don't bother with sense. Don't bother with, with chronology. Don't bother. None of it matters. So. What? Don't bother with the facts. Don't bother with sense. Don't bother with, with chronology. Don't bother. None of it matters. What, what was what was that? Again. Don't bother with the facts. Don't bother with sense. Don't bother with, with chronology. Don't bother. None of it matters. Chronology. He's saying chronology. Okay. Just making sure. So, Barbie is now sent back to the real world. And she is now going to experience the apotheosis of ah. what it means to be a human woman. So, we've learned early on in the movie, when she goes to the real world, she's catcalled by a bunch of the construction guys. And she says, I don't have a vagina. And she, again, amazing line for your, for your seven-year-old girl. I, 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 I love it so apparently when she has turned into a real woman she has now grown a vagina so the first thing that she does is she goes to the gynecologist because later why would you ruin the punchline of the joke by saying that right away she she's with the mom and the daughter and they're both wishing her good luck and she gets out of the car and the implication is that now that she's a real woman barbie's gonna have to get a job like an actual job so she steps into this building and she goes up to a receptionist behind a desk and she's like oh hello my name's uh, barbie and then the receptionist's like what are you here for and barbie looks down smiling and she's like i'm here to see my gynecologist and it's very funny because the one big physical difference between a Barbie doll and a human woman is obviously the fact that Barbie dolls don't have genitals because why would they have those? So the joke is you think that after all that big scene where they talk about humanity and accepting her death and accepting everything that comes along with being human, that they she would like have this big meaningful finale. But no, it's a joke about having a now and then the movie ends and it's actually really good. And it's why Ben can't argue that this movie takes itself seriously because it it doesn't. It doesn't. Ladies, the apotheosis of your being is not motherhood. We, we got rid of that at the very beginning. We're not talking about the apotheosis of motherhood. We're talking about a joke to end on after an extremely contemplative and emotionally heavy finale. This is the final joke. The, the finale happened. It was her accepting to be human. And it's not being a wife or a partner because women are supposed to be apart from men. No, they're not. Why would he, he, he male aggrievement, male aggrievement? Why? How could you end the film on her being a mother of us? Oh, you're going to like the final scene is her being knocked up. What do you what do you mean? She she's doing the first thing you have to do before you get knocked up. You go to the gynecologist. Have that reading. It is your vagina. It is that you go to the gynecologist. Ladies, this is what makes you the most human you can be. That's not. What is said in the film? It's just an end joke because you expect it to be super significant and meaningful or some kind of step towards normalization of the human world. But the joke is that now she has a pussy. That's the fu it's funny because it's like, oh, you're right. Now she does have a pussy. She would have to do that. Also, according to transphobes, having a pussy is the most important part of being a woman. So, you know, that you go to the gynecologist. Now, I could point out here that that's really transphobic. That according to the same people who made this mo movie, not all women have vaginas. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? It's transphobic to say a woman has a vagina. What? How? And not all people with penises are men. What is? What? It's one character who has a vagina. It's it's transphobic that the Barbie wasn't trans. I could point that out right here. Because it obviously conflicts with the... You could. It would be about as stupid as everything else you've said. The very ending of the film. But instead, I'm going to go with this one. At the end of all of this, uh, copy, they've uh, boiled uh, down. Uh, they, they have a whole conversation about identity uh, and uh, death uh, and uh, meaning. Uh, right, this whole conversation. What does it boil down to at the very end? What it boils down to at the very end, apparently, is 
being biologically female is the only thing that matters. And this is like, this has nothing to do with the movie. This is just complete like moonshot logic that has nothing to do with anything. Because Ben is a propagandist. Everything he says has to be an epic own on feminism. So it doesn't matter. He can manufacture literally anything, any narrative at all, you know? It, it's, it's like it, insane. It is literally like a joke. Again, you have multiple minutes of the emotional conclusion of the film where Barbie accepts her own death. And then the final shot is a joke meant to leave you on a lighter note. And the joke is something that is trivial but obvious. If Barbie's becoming a woman rather than a Barbie, she's going to have a pussy probably. So she goes with a gynecologist. And that's it. That's it. That's it. This, that's it. It's The, the rest of this is, it, it's, it, this is psychotic. Completely psychotic. That's it, kind of. That that's is like, it. That's it. Like, it all just boils down to a lady at the gynecologist. That's female power. Female power is Barbie goes I to- I must have forgot the line where she says, this is what it means to be a woman at the gynecologist. Gynecologist. Which, I don't know about you ladies, but that seems like that's not like the most feminist message, that lady parts are the, the entirety of the lady. So, um, so excellent, excellent job. Okay, I'm done. I can't take anymore. Also, we're way past stream time. We're an hour over. Thank you. Um, okay, so what are the conclusions from this? For one, if you are a conservative, you are incapable of doing media analysis because media promotes human narratives and human stories and uh, uh, conservatives are anti-human. They are demons. Uh, they're not real people. Ben Shapiro is not a real person. However, there is yet good news. Um, ben Shapiro was mostly doing this as rage bait and he was successful in, uh, in that uh, uh, faculty. But he earned a lot of hate for this that I don't think will translate into financial gain for his organization. There's a lot of good to be seen here. The Barbie movie was unabashedly feminist and it's doing really, really, really well. Uh, ben Shapiro is being especially vitriolic here because in terms of ideology, this is pretty much the most feminist event from Hollywood that I that I am ever aware of. It is unabashedly feminist and it is doing very well. And for that reason, uh, it is an ideological threat to conservatism because conservatism and fascism are primarily about hating women. I've talked about this before, hating, fearing, being jealous of, being vindictive towards, craving women, whatever. Uh, that's basically the precursor to conservatism fundamentally. It's unfortunately all a product of gender relations. At least a huge part of it is. So Ben has to create a mystical narrative where every element of the movie is individually misinterpreted and thread it all together as, uh, you know, ultimately a screed on male hate, which it's just not. The people in the comments are making fun of him. Oh, there's Mark Dice. Hey, Mark Dice. Oh, wait, is that making fun of him? I think this is a neutral comment. Isn't Mark Dice a lunatic? Yeah, Mark Dice a lunatic. I think basically anyone would like that one then. Whatever the case may be, there are plenty of dislikes. I think that overall we should be very happy about the Barbie movie, and uh, I think you guys should see it, because it's pretty good. Also, look, you can watch it on YouTube, pre-order it at least, and it says right there, PG-13. Ben Shapiro must have missed that.